Good afternoon. And friends, after the formal opening of the 2015 International Conference Water and Sustainable Development from Vision to Action, we now begin with the first of the afternoon sessions to set the scene on the water-related sustainable development goals. We wish to inform all participants that we can with a live webcast of the conference, accessible through the conference uh, webpage, and also that we will be sharing highlights and updates uh, through Twitter. You may follow us in English at water underscore decade and in Spanish at Decada del Agua. So now I, uh, we, we would like to welcome the chair and panelists of the first afternoon session to please join the the plenary, and uh, who will share um, on the progress and challenges in relation to the water-related SDGs, as well as the interlinkages with other processes. Um, I would like to give the floor to the, to the chair of the session, uh, again, Blanca Jimenez, uh, UN Water Vice Chair and uh, Director of the Division of Water Sciences at UNESCO IHP. And, uh, and please, if the panelists can join the plenary. Thank you. Karin and Joachim, if you want to be with us here at the podium, please. Uh, he wants, okay, that's twice. Yeah, <laughs> Our first speaker, Our first speaker, is Richard O'Connor. He will be uh, talking about sustainable development challenges and opportunities. Richard O'Connor has been author of uh, and facilitator of the third World Water Development Report uh, that was uh, presented um, some years ago. And he's also, he has served also as a special policy advisor and senior technical consultant to the Japan, what, Japanese Water Forum on several topics. He, his background is on global biochemistry, which uh, we didn't know. <laughs> I, in fact, I did a, a little of Google research and I was surprised about the background of our colleagues. You will learn about that uh, later. So please, uh, Richard. Thank you very yours. much. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, good afternoon. The forthcoming World Water Development Report titled Water in a Sustainable World, will examine the many, often complex, interlinkages between water and the social, economic, and environmental uh, dimensions of sustainable development. It will describe water's role in addressing several critical developmental challenges, including water supply, sanitation, and hygiene, accelerated urbanization, food and energy security, industrial growth, and climate change. The report also includes regional perspectives and concludes with a section on responses and implementation. The purpose of my presentation today is not to provide a chapter-by-chapter -chapter summary of the report, which is currently in its final stages of preparation, but to give you a broad sense of the report's content, its scope, and what can be expected in terms of main messages. In accordance with its basic mandate, the report provides an overview of the state of the resource and the balance or imbalance between supply and demand. In keeping with the theme of the report, these are presented in the context of unsustainable development pathways and governance failures that have generated immense pressures on water resources, affecting its quality and availability, and in turn compromising its availability to generate social and economic benefits. The report also describes some of the main constraints and challenges that some would call barriers to progress. These include the challenges associated with persistent poverty and social equity, arguing that poverty-oriented water interventions can make a difference for billions of people. These also include the challenges related to inequitable access to water supply and sanitation services, the, limit, the limitations imposed by inadequate financing for water resources management and service provision, and the many challenges that come from working with limited data and information 
about the resource and its use. <clears throat> a water secure world is more than a goal unto itself. It is a critical and necessary step towards a sustainable future. Progress in each of the three dimensions of sustainable development is bound by the limits imposed by finite and often vulnerable water resources and on the way these resources are managed to provide services and benefits. It is therefore imperative that the role of water is taken into account when seeking to address the great majority of sustainable development objectives. And this is why the report examines water's role within each of the three dimensions of sustainable development. The report's coverage of a water's social dimension focuses on the challenge of poverty and equity, arguing that poverty-oriented water interventions can have direct immediate and long-term social, economic, and environmental results, making a difference for billions of people. With respect to economic development, the report shows how, over the long term, water development benefits spill over into the entire economy, and wise, as wise investment in water infrastructure and sound management facilitate the structural changes necessary in many developing and intermediate economies to foster further advances in many productive areas of the economy. <clears throat> Ecosystem services remain undervalued, underrecognized, and underutil underutilized within economic and resource management approaches. The report examines the environmental dimensions of water management and the role of ecosystems, arguing for a more holistic focus on ecosystems for water and development to ensure that their benefits are maintained. The inter those interlinkages between water and the sustainable development reach far beyond its social, economic, and environmental dimensions. The report goes on to describe six critical challenge areas in which water plays a vital role and where policies and actions at the core of sustainable development can be strengthened or weakened through water. The challenges at the interface of water and sustainable development can vary from one region to the other. So, as with other recent WWDRs, this report includes five short chapters offering different regional perspectives on the theme. Lack of access to water sanitation and hygiene, or WASH, takes a huge toll on health and well-being and comes at a large financial cost, including a sizable loss of economic activity. Investments in water and sanitation services result in substantial economic gains. Despite some important progress over the past 15 years, WASH remains a critical challenge across Africa and in many parts of Latin America, Caribbean, and Asia-Pacific regions. The increase in the number of people without access to water and sanitation in urban areas is directly related to the rapid growth of slum populations in the developing world and the inability or unwillingness of local and national governments to provide adequate water and sanitation facilities to these communities. Experiences from cities around the world show that it is possible to, inform, uh, sorry, to pr improve performance of urban water systems while continuing to expand the system and addressing the needs of the poor, provided there is strong leadership and good governance. Although the phenomenon is widespread throughout all developing regions, accelerated urbanization will be particularly prominent in the Asia Pacific. The current growth rates of agricultural demands on the world's water, fresh water resources are unstable, sorry, unsustainable. To increase efficiency in the use of water, Agriculture can reduce uh, water loss and, more importantly, increase crop productivity with respect to water. Experience from high-income countries shows water pollution can be reduced through a combination of incentives, including more string stringent regulation, enforcement, and well-targeted subsidies. 
only 5% of Africa's cultivated land is irrigated. Energy production is generally water intensive. Meeting ever-growing demands for energy will generate increasing stress on freshwater resources with repercussions on other users, such as agriculture and industry. Since these sectors also require, uh, since these sectors also require energy, there is room to create synergies as they develop together. Wind, solar PV, and geothermal energy, which do not require large quantities of water, can make a substantial contribution to energy supply and lower freshwater demand at local and national scales, even if they do remain marginal at the global scale. Less than 10% of Africa's hydropower potential is utilized for electricity generation. Industrialization can, can drive development by increasing productivity, jobs, and income towards the eradication of poverty. It can also provide opportunities for gender equity and youth employment. It is incumbent upon political and legal authorities to develop appropriate incentives for industries, be it standards, permissions, prohibitions, fines, charges, etc., with a view to align business decisions with sustainable development objectives. Increasing re, uh, resource use efficiency, reducing waste and pollution, influencing consumption, consumption patterns, and choosing appropriate technologies are some of the key uh, challenges facing Europe and North America. The essence of sustainable freshwater resources management is balancing freshwater supplies and demands and uses in a matter that, uh, to ensure that water availability is there for the present and future generations. Climate variability and change may affect both sides of the balance and thus adds to the challenge. Adaptive water management aims to move away from a predict and control paradigm towards an approach based on flexibility, resilience, and continuous learning. Asia and the Pacific is the most disaster prone region in the world and the exposure of people to assets and assets to hydrometeorological hazards continues to grow. The fact that this report will be released just before the post-2015 SDGs are finalized is an important opportunity for us, but it has also been a significant challenge to prepare the report without really knowing exactly what the SDGs are going to be. The experience of the MDGs shows that a thematically broader, more detailed and context-specific goal for water, one that goes beyond water, the issues of water and sanitation, is called for in the post-2015 development agenda. In our report, the discussions on the SDGs focus on the need for a dedicated goal for water and on the five targets proposed by UN Water in 2014, which Joachim will cover right after my presentation. The outcome document for the 20, uh, 2012 UN Conference on Sustainable Development, titled The Future We Want, recognizes that water is at the core of sustainable development. But at the same time, development and economic growth create pressures on the, on the resource that can ultimately threaten water security for humans and nature. Water management and decisions affecting water will play a key role in addressing the development and challenges of the 21st century, including urbanization, some sustainable industrial development, economic growth, eradicating persistent poverty, ensuring food and energy security, responding to new patterns of consumption, and adapting to climate change. Oh, not to mention conserving uh, threatened ecosystems. Addressing these water-related challenges will require changing the way we assess, manage, and use our water resources. Progress in terms of water-related governance calls for engaging a broad range of actors through inclusive governance structures that recognize the dispersion of decision-making across various levels and entities. It is, for example, imperative to acknowledge women's contributions to local water management and the role in decision-making related to water. It is also necessary to strengthen social, administrative, and political accountability. And our report presents a wide range of measures that can be adopted to help meet this objective. 
Investing in all aspects of water management, service provision, and infrastructure is beneficial to, society, to, to social and economic development. Blending structural and non-structural approaches, including natural infrastructure, is particularly cost-effective. Risks and various water-related security issues can also be reduced by technical and social approaches. One example is to treat water, uh, sorry, to treat wastewater as a resource. There are a growing number of examples of reclaimed wastewater being used for agriculture, for irrigating, uh, for irrigating municipal parks and fields, in industrial cooling systems, and in some cases safely mixed in with drinking water. Social equity is one of the dimensions of sustainable development that has been insufficiently addressed in development of water and development policies. Sustainable development and human rights perspectives both call for reductions in, in, in inequities and tackling disparities in access to water-related services. Prioritizing investments in the provision of basic, uh, basic services unlocks the potential of economic growth and breaks the vicious cycle of low productivity linked to poor health and lack of education opportunities that maintain poverty. A pro-poor a pro -poor pricing keep, uh, policy keeps costs as low as possible while ensuring that water services are paid for at a level that supports the maintenance and potential expansion of the system. The Joint Monitoring Program for Water Supply and Sanitation has reported impressive gains over the, la the last two decades, with 2.3 billion people gaining access to an improved drinking water source and 1.9 billion to an improved sanitation facility. Of those gaining access to drinking water, 1.6 now use a higher level of service, a piped water supply on premises. Progress has also been reported with respect to agricultural productivity, the implementation of integrated water resources management, land use, urban planning, and social equity, including gender, gender mainstreaming. But still much remains to be accomplished. The development of the post-2015 SDGs provides a critical opportunity to generate progress. Achieving the SDGs by 2030 will require a concerted effort among multiple domains and sectors, and water will need to be recognized as the nexus through which various SDGs and other uh, developmental objectives are linked. Water efficiency gains in one domain can help relieve constraints in others and contribute to the realization and sharing of great, greater benefits to society. With that, I thank you for your kind attention and ask you to keep in mind the report will be released on March 20 this year. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for uh, setting uh, uh, the scene uh, for the sustainable development goals and for raising the issue on the challenge to define the challenge before knowing the SDGs also normally we define first the problem and then we should uh, define the targets. I think it was a little bit uh, tricky what you were mentioning in there is uh, something that has to do with a matter of ethics what should be first. Our next speaker is Joaquin Harley. He, he is um, the responsible person to coordinate and develop the freshwater aspects at, U at UNDP's water and ocean governance programs worldwide. He's an expert on water resources and international development. And he has an extensive experience uh, in different projects in Africa, Asia, U Europe, and Latin America. His background is in, in uh, hydrology engineering, which uh, I'm, I must say uh, was also a surprise for me because mm -hmm. many people in the in young water think that you are an economist. No, I'm an economist. Oh, did you did? Uh, wow, well, <laughs> that's good. So please, <laughs> check it. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, I've been asked to um, set the stage a little bit, uh, and um, so the title of my presentation is Water and the Proposed SDGs, the Current State of Play. So this is going to be very much about process, what's happened, and what is coming forward. 
And I'd like to divide it into two parts, what I call the first half of the game, and then we have a little breather. And then we go into the second half of the game, and this little breather we had now over Christmas. But if we look at the elements here now, the first half, uh, and um, some of which, we can start off, you know, after uh, the Rio Plus 20 conference. We then had a, a, a series of uh, consultations, and Ewan Water was asked to lead the, the thematic consultations on water, and together with GWP, national consultations were also done <coughs> in 22 countries. In fact, water was the only thematic area where we also did national consultations, and this very much thanks to GWP and their presence at the regional and national level. There was also work uh, within Ewan Water to develop uh, a joint technical advice paper. Because we felt that it was important to speak with one voice and, and to show that, that water is definitely much more than wash. And uh, in February 2014, we were able to, to present this technical advisory paper at the president of the GA's uh, discussions on water and sanitation and sustainable energy in New York. Following that, there was also another GWP-led uh, series of consultations at the national level based on the technical advice paper, trying to get uh, uh, voices from the ground on the relevance of what has been proposed, the applicability, and, and, um, and so forth, uh, including uh, the targets and the indicators. Um, we had interaction with the Open Working Group, and in, uh, on 19th of July, then, the Open Working Group presented its final report. And I'll come to that in a little bit. And on 10th September, the GA adopted the report and its findings. And on the 4th of December, the Secretary General launched a synthesis report. So this is just the elements, right? I'll go into a little bit more detail. Uh, so let's have a look at this, uh, what Ewan Water then proposed. Well, Ewan Water, to begin with, suggested that there should be a dedicated water goal. Even if water is interlinked to very many topics, and we've heard about that already, there is a need for a dedicated goal to address water and the many aspects of water in a coherent and dedicated manner. And uh, these are the five elements that were... Let's see if I can point with this thing. Oh, no, you can, you can see it. Anyhow, first of all, obviously, there's still a lot to be done when it comes to access to safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene. Going forward then, there's a need then to address the use and development of water resources, including water efficiency for many various productive uses. There's a need to look at, at governance of water resources, including uh, an IWM approach, including looking at the transboundary setting and so forth. Uh, legal, institutional, and uh, policies. The next area was related uh, to uh, wastewater, water quality, and pollution, and, water re and wastewater reuse. And we formulated uh, a, a target on that as well. And then finally, we felt that there's also a need then to address water-related disasters, both human-induced and natural water-related Disaster. So these were the main components of what UN Water proposed. Now we were quite pleased that the Open Working Group picked up on all of this advice, and um, and they even expanded on it, uh, 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 drawing on on other elements of of what we had been um, suggesting. Their proposed uh, uh, proposal in, in the outcome document includes 17. SDGs and up to 169 targets. And this can sound as a very broad and large agenda, but we have to keep in mind that this, the development uh, of, of this report comes from this extensive consultation process. It's a very, very different process to when the MDGs were formulated. So it's very much a bottom-up consultative process, and the Open Working Group itself was included up to 100 uh, member states uh, taking part and, and um, also trying to, to look at all the different aspects of sustainable development in their countries. Now, one of the goals explicitly deals with water and sanitation. 
and I'll come to that in a bit. But also in the Shapo and other um, goals and targets, there are also links to water. So this is the, the list, uh, and I'm sure most of you have seen this, but we see there there are 17 goals, and goal number six on the list is, is the one related to water. So let's have a little look at, at how water is more explicitly uh, reflected by the Open Working Group in their document. And it starts already in the chapeau. And it talks about uh, the right to, to uh, food and, and to water. And uh, we know that it's very important to, to address the human right to, to water and sanitation and to further work on that. And it's reflected by the Open Working Group. Goal number six is the main water goal. Ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And here you can see that they divided up the wash target uh, into two, one related to drinking water and one related to sanitation and hygiene. The third uh, target was, is related to uh, water quality, to wastewater, recycling, reuse. You can see, uh, again, the link there to the advice from you and water. If we then uh, go forward to uh, target number four, uh, this really re relates then to uh, water use efficiency and um, uh, addressing water scarcity issues. And then they have a specific um, target. Uh, they don't talk about water governance uh, per se, but they talk about integrated water resources management at all levels, including transboundary cooperation as appropriate. And this, I know, it was uh, something that was a little sensitive in the discussions, and that's why this appropriate has come into play. And, um, and then uh, we have uh, target 6.6, which is related to water-related ecosystems. Now, just to give a flavor of how water is also cross-cutting and interlinking into to the proposal from the Open Working Group, we can see that in uh, goal one, which is related to poverty, there is uh, uh, also a reference here to climate-related extreme events. And this comes back also in goal 11. In goal three, we, we see uh, references to water and waterborne diseases and pollution and contamination, very much also related to, um, to targets, uh, especially target 6.1, related to sanitation and, and the one related on wastewater and pollution. We see interlinkages there. Now, where did uh, water-related disasters go? Well, it was decided by the Open Working Group to keep the disasters under Goal 11. And we believe it's not specifically linked to human settlements, but rather to keep uh, uh, the disasters in one place. So here in uh, Target 11.5, we find then um, uh, the target related to uh, water-related disasters. And um, if we move on then to goal 12, we can see that uh, it, we again come back to issues related to water quality and pollution. And in goal 15, again, also links related to uh, ecosystems and their services uh, and um, how, how they contribute to, to uh, water quality and, and so on. Now, the good news is that this report covers, you could say, basically the most important elements of, of the bigger, broader water agenda. So as such, we, we were quite pleased. It was about as good as we could have hoped for. And the General Assembly adopted the, the report on 10th of September, and uh, claim, saying that it would be the main basis for integrating sustainable development goals into the post-2015 development agenda. So that concludes, more or less, the first half of the game. So here we are now. This is uh, at the turn of the year here. And, and we now move into the second half of the game. And, and what will that look like? Well, first of all, it will be informed by the SG's synthesis report. And I won't go through all the details of what's happening there in the second half. But as you can see, there are a number of parallel processes. I'm going to pick up on some of them. And now Karin is going to come back and talk a little bit more about uh, uh, some, some of the related processes as well. So let, let's just quickly go through, but it, it, will, uh, it, it, it sort of culminates with um, the UN summit in September, where 
the, the SDG framework will be adopted. Well, on 4th of December, to set the stage for the second half, the Secretary General uh, launched his synthesis report. And uh, the report is very balanced. Uh, it, it includes, uh, obviously, um, all the different elements that have fed into up to this point. And it's very clear on its support to the 17 goals and the 169 targets proposed by the Open Working Group. And it also proposes six essential elements. And uh, you can see that in this illustration here, dignity and people, prosperity and the planet, justice and partnership, as a way of framing and possibly communicating um, the, the global agenda. As, of course, 169 targets under 17 goals is quite a complex thing to communicate. The report says that it's very important, you know, to address the unfinished business of the MDGs and see that as a springboard into the future we want. And that's, that's also, I think, uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, it also wants to, to broaden out uh, and, 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 and have a more comprehensive uh, post-2015 develop, development agenda. The report doesn't explicitly say that, that these 17 goals and, and 169 targets are to be clustered under these six elements. So it's still a little bit of a question remaining whether this will be used mainly as a communications tool or if, if those elements will have more significance. But it's put on the table as, 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 as guidance and, and um, support to, to the member states for their forthcoming negotiations. The report also focuses on means of implementation. It, it, that includes financing and technology. It talks also about implementation accountability issues. So the question is, now what? So this is the roadmap. <laughs> yes. It's up to us. We, we've got to see now what's going to happen. Well, now what? And I, I'm sorry this is a bit boring, this is, but I have to sort of set the stage on the process. And, and I know we're going to spend day, uh, these days now discussing much more content. But, but this is supposed, supposedly is the backdrop to which we can feed it into. So what I've highlighted with blue here, uh, they, they are the different sessions of the General Assembly when they will be negotiating the post-2015 development agenda. So if we look at them then, uh, it starts off now 1921 of, of January with the stock-taking exercise. They get, they're going to move on to discuss the declaration. What is the declaration going to look like? And what is, will it include? And there, there's already an outline of, of what they believe should be in there. But you can see also interspersed here a couple of main water-related events. We're going to have the World Conferences on disaster risk reduction in Sendai, Japan in March. On 20th of March, we're going to celebrate World Water Day in New Delhi, India, and that's also going to be the launch of the World Water Development Report we just heard about. But then came five very critical days, which is or immediately following the World Water Day. And you might note that World Water Day is actually on the 22nd, but that's a Sunday. <coughs> so um, that's why the celebration is on a Friday. So during five days, that's when the actual SDGs, the 17 goals and the targets, are going to be discussed or negotiated. It's not quite clear exactly how this will go, how the, it will be done, what it will be included, but it's, it's seen as a technical proving and, and, and um, there's a need to, of reassurance that these goals are implementable and the targets are measurable, that it's feasible. And um, I pick up there, there's quite a strong sentiment from uh, many countries not to reopen or renegotiate the outcome of the Open Working Group, and as such, it's already been adopted by the GA. But there are some uh, countries that are pressing to have a smaller set of, of goals and targets. So that remains to be seen. And, and the member states, they might decide to make some technical adjustments uh, and, and also, uh, you know, take a bit of a, bit of a more broader assessment and the balance of, of the goals and targets. We'll, we'll see how that pans out. But, but those five days are dedicated to discussing the actual goals and targets. And then they move on, having sessions then on monitoring 
and a review of implementation. Going on to the means of implementation and, and a global partnership for sustainable development and the preparation of the draft outcome document. Then there is a big international conference uh, which will be very important uh, for this uh, process and that's going to be in Addis Ababa which is about uh, financing for development, obviously extremely critical. After which they will finalize the outcome document which then will be um, uh, you know, the basis for the high level summit in New York. Now this is about uh, technically about the actual process of arriving at the, the SDG, SDGs as such. But in parallel, there's a process here now related to indicators, data collection, and reporting. And um, already in, in, the, in the SG's um, synthesis report, there is a recommendation, and this has now been picked up, that indicator work will be taken up and led by the UN Statistical Commission. And they, in turn, have the statistical division of UNDESA serving as a secretariat. And they're starting up already now in January. They're planning an online consultation on indicators. So this is an opportunity, I hope, for all of us to contribute and interact. They're going to establish uh, an expert group, which will then have a meeting in February to verify and validate the, the indicators. And, and these findings will then go into a, 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 stati a statistical commission meeting to be held in March. Later on, uh, an interagency and expert group uh, on SDG indicators will be formed. And uh, there will be work uh, by them leading up to a final SDG framework. And, and this is planned to be endorsed only in February, March 2016. So, so this, that's why I'm saying these things are going a little bit in parallel. So, so there is time now for us to interact and ensure that we, we also contribute when it comes to water issues into this framework. <coughs> now, finally, what is UN Water doing? So we are working now continuously on indicators, data collection and reporting, and, and, and to interact in that process. We're also uh, making ourselves available and supporting the continued discussions and negotiations on the role of water in the post-2015 development agenda. We want to build awareness and, uh, and, and work also broadly, not just uh, to, to policymakers, but also to the general public and private sector and other actors through our 2015 World Water Day campaign now at all levels. So just to conclude, I believe water is fundamental to sustainable development and it will be needed to be addressed whether or not it's explicitly included in the SDG framework or not. So I urge us all now to let's keep the pressure on all the way and win this match because we, we still have this second half to play for our people, for our societies and for our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joaquin, for making such a comprehensive uh, presentation and making sound that it was easy to manage the UN water team. <laughs> this was indeed a challenge, but I think it is one of the first efforts uh, that uh, have been done in that way because uh, this UN water family is not always that friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Karin Lexen. She's uh, very well known for being the director of the World Water Week, maybe less known for being the director of the prices department at, at the Stockholm Inst International Water Institute. He has a lot of experience on international environmental politics and advocacy, and maybe less known is that she is an environmental chemist. And uh, her expertise is in organic pollutants. I think that was... <laughs> so I'm happy to be here. And as you said, I have some different hats, actually. Um, uh, it's very good to see all of you here. And I'm, what I'm supposed to do is trying to give you a little bit of, of the elements of the other processes that are also um, 
taking place this year. Um, so in addition to, to uh, sort of being in charge of the World Water Week and the prizes, I'm also in charge of coordinating CV's efforts in, in, in those different processes. And as was already said by the UN Water Chair, 2015 is indeed a very important year, not only for the Sustainable Development Goals, but also for, for decisions on a new framework on disaster risk <coughs> reduction and hopefully a new climate deal to be set in Paris towards the end of the year. So first out is, as Joachim already mentioned, the third World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. And the idea is that this conference should adopt a post-2015 disaster risk reduction framework and that this framework will be endorsed by the UN General Assembly, in fact, at the same time as the UN Assembly takes uh, the formal decision on the, on the SDGs. And this very week, uh, the final negotiations are taking place in Geneva to discuss the draft, uh, draft text for, for that agreement. I'm coming back a little bit to that in a moment. The second process is the uh, climate negotiations, the United Nations framework on climate change. And um, as you, most of you probably know, there was a trial to, to uh, take an agreement on formally be binding uh, targets in Copenhagen five years ago. This uh, trial failed. I'm not going to try to get into the details of that. But uh, the Paris meeting is supposed to finally take this further. There was a meeting uh, every year. That there are new meetings of the parties to the, to the climate convention. So uh, in Durban in 2011, there was one, the, the 18th conference of the parties where parties decided on a plan for an agreement to be decided in Paris in 2015, uh, with some elements, some, some components to, to be decided upon. And then there's the third very important meeting, uh, and that's the uh, third uh, international conference on financing for development. And that one is building, it's the third conference, because it's building on um, the Monterey Consensus. Perhaps the Monterey, Monterey Consensus is mostly known for the, 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 the place where parties decided on uh, the, the, the um, amount of uh, foreign aid, the 0.7% uh, target that few countries have have met, as we know. It also builds on, on a Doha declaration. In addition to that, the Rio Plus 20 decided, in addition to, to the work on the, on, the, on the goals, it decided to establish an international committee of experts on sustainable development financing. So this conference is, is supposed to evaluate uh, the, the, the uh, efforts so far and to propose options for effective financing for sustainable de development. And it is, of course, very easy to understand that to the end of the day, financing will play a very important role in implementation of the SDGs. So some people state that this is perhaps the most important conference <laughs> of all the conferences that have been taking place. Um, I'm not sure I agree, but anyway, it's very important. <coughs> and the discussions around financing are indeed very important. Also, these uh, negotiations are taking place towards this uh, final meeting. Um, and there's an important meeting in, in New York on the 13th to 17th of April. You don't have to read all this text. <laughs> But uh, what I wanted to, to say also in, in, in this presentation is that 
as we see it as CEWA, we have two challenges throughout the year. We have one challenge, of course, to raise the importance of water in all these uh, processes. We also have uh, the role to advocate for a coherent approach so that these different processes are being related and to the end of the day, the implementation is coordinated. And, and these texts are actually from the current draft of the, of the uh, agreement on the disaster risk reduction. So it speaks about the necessity to link between the different processes. It's, it speaks about how to do it. I will come back later to how to take words to deeds. What about water? I think um, when it comes to the SDGs, we've come pretty far. Um, I think it's pretty good. If we look at the negotiations on disaster risk reduction, knowing that about 90% of all disasters are water related, one might ask if we have really come that far, if you see that there is in fact one good text that really elaborates a little bit on water right now in the current text. This is the one I have on the screen. And water is only mentioned three times in the draft that's on the table right now. Here I think we still have, uh, I mean, it's not a very long way to go until Sendai in, in March. But this is really pinpointing the importance we have, all of us, to continuing talking about the necessity to see water as a very important element in dealing with disaster risk reduction. Um, also, of course, it's very important that the process on disaster risk reduction is linking up with the negotiations on climate change. And I will also come back a little bit more to that in a minute. But there is at least one text, one suggestion in the current draft to disaster risk reduction, as you can see, that suggests promote integration and joint planning with climate change adaptation actions. So this text is saying that when we are discussing disaster risk reduction, we also need to integrate that with our climate adaptation work. If we then move over to Lima, what happened in Lima? Can I just one as it, um, it talks about the ADP. The ADP stands for the action, uh, the ad hoc group on the Durban platform. I was previously talking about that we need uh, th th that there was an agreement on a plan, and that plan was called the Durban Platform. So here it says uh, very, very concretely that the, the, the work towards Paris, because that is what it says, uh, that the purpose is to adopt a protocol and not a legal instrument or an agreed outcome with legal force under the convention applicable to all parties. The discussion right now on the climate negotiations is if it's going to be legally binding targets. That was our hope. But what I hear many saying is that we're still trying to push for it, but it's not sure that we, to the end of the day, will have an agreement with legally binding uh, targets. Instead, something else has turned up on the scene, and that is called intended nationally determined contributions. And right now, these are sort of parallel to, to the idea of an agreement on binding targets. But these have become more and more important. The idea is that every country, developed or developing countries, should submit their determined contributions, they intended determined contributions, and that they shall do that 
before the end of March, developed and developing countries. In this, they have to say something about uh, mitigation, meaning reducing greenhouse gases. Um, the, the developing countries also wanted it to be obligatory to have something about adaptation, but uh, right now it's voluntary. As you may understand, these uh, will also include discussions on financing. Because, of course, when you say that everyone has to contribute suggestions on how to reduce their, their, their greenhouse gas emissions, including developing countries, including poor countries, of course they say that we need some kind of contribution from the richer uh, uh, countries uh, where they are saying that they are intending to give us more resources. So this is again a new uh, discussion coming up. Also, the old principle on common but differentiated responsibilities that refers back to, to the richer uh, countries paying for some of the actions that the poorer countries are doing has been discussed and questioned a lot by some of the developing countries saying, but the, the world does not look the same as it did in Stockholm 72 when this principle was starting to, to be discussed. Uh, so, uh, in, in, and, and actually in the Durban platform, the notion of, of, of uh, differentiated but, uh, common but differentiated uh, responsibilities was deleted. But it came back in Lima with an addition saying, in light of different national circumstances. And this one comes from the deal between China and US that was uh, made just a month or, or even less before the, the, the Lima conference. So this is a way to say, well, we have a different, we still have poorer countries and richer countries, but it's a wider spectrum, and we don't want this divide between rich and poor anymore. We've been around for quite some time, as see we, uh, to, to see if we can sort of discuss water in, in the climate negotiations. If I said we have associated well with the SDGs and, well, could have gone better with the disaster risk reduction, if you look into the texts of the, of the, of the climate change uh, processes, uh, it isn't that uh, successful. However, I would say, and I also see <laughs> Ursula here from Global Water Partnership that has also been very active and many others here also work with the Alliance for Global Water, uh, Alliance on Global Water Adaptation. And uh, together, many of us have been trying to address water in the context of climate change. And I would say that the recognition amongst negotiators and partners has increased over these six years. They ask us for, for advice, they, they, they want our support. And for instance, the chair of the IPCC said in one of the side events that we organized in Lima, that water is critical to how we experience impacts, develop adaptation solutions to climate change, and ensure climate mitigation is effective. And I think the recognition of water also being related to mitigation is new. Uh, and you can also see it from the Swedish ambassador talking about water being important also for energy and for mitigation. And that relates to the theme you and Water had last year on water and energy. We have actually succeeded in, in raising the issue that water and energy is also connected and thereby also mitigation. In order to be successful in, in reducing greenhouse gases in a good way, we are dependent on water. So, where can we look if we, we want to look into uh, the Lima and into Paris? I think, and we think, that the intended nationally uh, dot, dot contributions are really important. It's not really clear what they will contain, but here we have a chance to talk to countries saying that when you are submitting what you are doing, you can also integrate water. Then we have something called the Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage that deals with, as you can see, this is a disaster risk reduction too, but in UNFCCC. And uh, right now there, 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 is, there, there is a program where, where it suggests that there's a need for, 
for looking at risk management, to, to coordinate with other efforts, and to find resources. And here we can clearly see that this is the same language as, as the one on disaster risk reduction. The Green Climate Fund met its target uh, of uh, 10 billion um, dollar in Lima of, of uh, pledges, meaning 27 countries has promised to give money to the Green Climate Fund, which is the fund that is supposed to, to, to fund the climate, uh, um, many of the climate activities. Interestingly, five developing countries, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, South Korea, and Mongolia, were amongst those 70, uh, 27 countries. And uh, the Green Climate Fund have the basic systems and procedures in place. So it's really important that donors are starting pledging money, promising money, uh, because the promise is that this fund would fund $100 billion a year from 2020. So you could say the Green Climate Fund is like an airplane ready to take off, but we don't know where it will land. So to try to uh, come to a con conclusion, as, and as you can understand, it's not so easy to give justice to all these processes, and I'm, I'm happy to, to respond to questions afterwards, but I wanted to give you a flavor and try to sort of trigger your, your, your ideas and understanding how important it is that we try to engage in these different processes. It's really important that we engage. It's also very important that we as the water community think of that water is an excellent example on how these different processes are linked together. I think what Rick said and what Joachim was saying is, is building under, under this. So, so each one of you can think of throughout this conference, how can experiences, knowledge from the case studies we're going to discuss, from also developing the toolbox, how can this bring forward very important uh, information to those who are now finalizing those different negotiations. And how can we help out so that the, the, the decisions to the end of the day will be implemented in a coordinated way? And I think this crowd sitting here is really important for this. So, you could say that, that the fact that we have three or four, def depending on how you want to define it, parallel processes throughout this year is a possibility to reinforce one another. It can also be a risk, for instance, that climate issues that are difficult to deal with uh, are dumped over to the discussions on the, open, on the development goals. One, one issue, for example, uh, there, there's a climate goal right now suggested. Is that a good or bad thing? That is something that could be discussed. First instinct is very good. We need a, a goal on climate. Some, some of the negotiators under the UNFCCC, some of the key ones, says that there is a risk that negotiators are dumping the problems over to the other process. That was why Rio Plus 20 didn't talk much about climate uh, because of the fear for sort of inheriting the problems from the UNCCC negotiations. And as I said before, next challenge would be how can the SDG targets and indicators be aligned with the post-2015 DRR framework and the climate agreement? And one very practical example is how can the, the UNFCCC adaptation framework and the loss and damage that I was talking briefly about before, and the disaster risk reduction framework be linked together. And we're the same people, so, so maybe we can help <laughs> the negotiators that are sort of negotiating in different silos, help them to see the bridges. And big question, uh, how will the different financial funds mechanisms be coordinated? We have a very busy year. I think the schedule Joachim showed before showed that. Uh, and I think we can all be assured we will know what to do over our days. Um, there are some important milestones in our own community. First, the Water Day, of course. 
then also the World Water Forum. And I think it would be wrong of me if I didn't take the chance to also welcome you all to, to the World uh, Water Week. Um, it's actually the 25th uh, uh, Water Symposium we are organizing. So it's going to be a big celebration. I also want to emphasize that, well, of course, we follow the theme of, of you and water. This, will be with this, this conference will take place about two weeks before the UN General Assembly. So this is the last possibility that we have to sort of come together and discuss and see where we are. It's a few months ahead of, of, the, of the conference of the parties in Paris. So we will devote quite a lot of time and, 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 and discussions to uh, the 2015 intergovernmental processes and discuss together with all of you how you would like to contribute to that. I think I overrode the time a little bit. I'm sorry for that. Um, I want to just finish by saying that if you still are interested in, in sending in proposals for events at the World of the Week, I brought a leaflet. And, and we have extended the date from the 18th of January to the 20th, so you have time to come home and write your proposal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Karin, if you stay here, and uh, Richard, if you bring a chair. We have a short time for some questions, but I think it's a great opportunity to, uh, for you to discuss with our speakers. If you don't have questions, I have challenging questions for them. <laughs> so, questions, comments? Well, while people think, I would like to know your opinion in one minute each. Do you think it's a good idea to link the SDG or not to link the SDGs process to the COP21? One minute each. And you are the last one, Karen, because you know no, that better. You. Okay, Richard, yes. please. Hello. I, I have no idea. What? What? Uh, just, <laughs> nice reply. Just, Jackie, no, but I can, Jackie. <laughs> 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 Do you let him get out of this? <laughs> uh, uh, put it this way, uh, from, from a technical perspective, from uh, as a scientist or, or, or from that level, I would say obviously these issues are so interrelated. But, but the world isn't like that. The world is, is driven by, by policy, uh, by, by uh, financing, by different uh, you know, political uh, processes. And therefore, I, I fear... I fear that if we put, if we merge, let's put it this way, if we merge or integrate the SDG agenda under the climate uh, COP agenda, um, we'll be dwarfed. Mm. Yeah. So because the, this, this, the, the, the climate uh, COP process is so high level political uh, and polit politicized and, and it's, it's so linked to national macroeconomy and, and that kind of commitments. So I'm just afraid that we, we will not uh, be visible. So that's why I believe that it's maybe it's better to, to keep these two processes a bit separate, but we need to ensure that they are linked. Karen, please. I don't think there's so much more to add. Uh, I think it's important, and I can see also that there are informal contacts between uh, those who are coordinating the, the, um, the COP and the... Um, and the SDGs, and that I think is important that they speak to each other and 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 try to find common ways ahead. Uh, I agree with you, Akim, that there is a risk if you would sort of transfer too much of the discussions, um, the hard discussions within the UNFCCC, to the um, to the discussion on SDGs, that could hamper the result. On the other side, uh, on the other hand, I've seen, and I talked to some people in Lima, saying that the model of, of how the open working group worked with sort of inviting civil society, having national consultations, has actually played a role for making the people negotiating on the UNFCCC to think that maybe they need other mechanisms because the mechanisms of the UNFCCC negotiations are really very bad very bureaucratic, very stuck, very, very... So, so I've seen an open, opening minds for maybe we can do this in another way. So in that sense, it has played a good role. 
I, I, I think that uh, this is a, a tricky question because the discussions both parallel are in parallel, and we are not discussing, as Karen said, but both agendas, the one for COP21 and the, the, uh, the IPCC report says that we need to move towards sustainable development, which is the goal of the, our goal. So, can I just say that uh, Lawrence Tubiana, who is the climate ambassador who came to Stockholm, she said that in fact she would like to see the, the COP21 as, as a conference on sustainable well, development. That, that's the point, and, uh, and, and we haven't had time to discuss that, and I think that uh, that was also Richard's uh, reaction. We haven't had the time to discuss because these processes are going one on one side, the other on the one side, and we're discussing similar things. But the money is in the green funds, even the money for the SDGs. So at a certain time, we will need to discuss because the countries are not going to give twice money for sustainable development. So there is something in there that we need to discuss. I have another uh, tricky question. Uh, one minute each, and we are going to start now with Karin. All these I know what Rick, Richard did, so... <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> this, this process of SDG is also of, uh, about involving people. And the initial term we were using in UN Water was about, uh, in the water agenda, it, it was about uh, achieving water security. It's a very catchy term. Still, politicians are using it, and many people are using it. It was dropped. What, what is your opinion about that, uh, Karen? It's good, it's bad, it doesn't matter. That it dropped the notion of water security? Oh, water security it was dropped. No, I don't think that was good. Um, I can understand why. And of course, we know the, 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 the negotiations on transboundary waters that, that you also were referring to are extremely tricky. And this is, of course, the 100 billion question how to deal with it. Because, of course, from my, my, my institute's perspective, we, we deal a lot with transboundary waters, and we think it's really important. But we also see... We, I've seen the motions in a room when, when this issue comes up. When that elephant comes into the room, it, it stalls a lot of other discussions. So, so, so the tricky question is when and how to sort of discuss well, it. You feel bad that water security is not there uh, as a concept. And yeah. what about you, Richard? The last one is uh, Joaquin, because I know he mastered the yeah. replay. <laughs> um, I personally kind of like the term water security. I understand that the whole security in, in an international context is seen in different ways. Uh, it, compared to energy security or food security, that's much clearer. I mean, that means you have food security. It means you have your country has enough food, either import or do it yourself, but enough food to maintain your population to defeat. Energy security is a little bit more tricky because of well, the, the tensions over oil and um, you know other forms of energy. So, but still, energy security is more or less an understood term. Now, water security is despite different. Uh, different attempts to define it because you're defining both a resource and a service and then there's the management of the resource and the service and both and that sort of duality of water and the perception see energy and food are things you bu can buy they're com commodities services to a certain extent they have clear monetary value whereas water is perceived as a gift of God a common good and then that that kind of removes the ability to, to define it into sort of a framework where you can call either your security. It's not just the amount of water, how clean it is. Um, the energy security doesn't necessarily consider clean energy. It's really the amount of energy and then you deal with the cleanliness or the climate change impacts after the fact. Whereas water, as a resource, you have to deal with its state to begin with. And for that reason, the definition of water security is a little bit difficult. Although it's a much easier thing to sell, because if you're if you're talking to media, there's a, you have a problem, you know, this action uh, or this decision might affect your country's energy security. That will get coverage, and that will get things talked about. So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't type of thing. So do you do, do you miss it in the? I, I'd like to use it. Okay. Yeah. Joachim, please. 
Um, it reminds me of um, when I went to a, a management course and um, the facilitator said like this, um, he was into Frisbee. Yeah. And he said, what is an, a perfect Frisbee throw? And he was very, very focused in his early days on you know, throwing the Frisbee. Until he later on realized that the perfect Frisbee throw is not how you throw the Frisbee. It's about how you catch the Frisbee on the other end. And I think that uh, that's why I would like to answer this question. I think that water security is very much from us, the water community, trying to do a perfect Frisbee throw. But you see, it's not being picked up and caught that way on the other end. So we have to think about how, how is it caught? How is the Frisbee caught? Until it, you catch the Frisbee, it's a useless fr Frisbee throw. So, so, and I think this applies to a lot of things that we're doing, honestly. We have to start to speak the language that communicates. And, and if, if, if the, the clients or the stakeholders, the politicians, policymakers, the, 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 the private sector, industry, agriculture, energy, if they don't understand what we're saying, if we don't go to them and speak their language, it doesn't matter what we say. Well, and the last question, one minute, if not, uh, uh, one minute only. Uh, so you ha we have three minutes, okay? <laughs> and uh, the last one will be Richard. I think he mentioned one uh, thing, that uh, defining the challenge before having the SDGs. Which should be the correct way, Joachim? No, because he, he was presenting the challenge for the SDG agenda, but he, was, he said it's difficult to set which should be the challenge if I don't know which the SDGs are going to be. But what should be first, defining the challenges or what? I, I killed it. I said the wrong thing. <laughs> Censored. One minute. It no, I, I think I, I understood it differently. I think the, 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 the problem that was there was trying to write a report that, will be, that has to be written beforehand and has to be relevant in a context that is like six months later on. And therefore, uh, it, it's, it's difficult then to, to be relevant at, you know, six months ahead for a process. It's like a moving target. I think that's how I saw the But problem. the report is about the challenges. No? Yeah, but the challenges have to be relevant in the context when it's published, otherwise uh, it doesn't make that's sense. That's what I'm saying. They have to write a report on what is water sustainability after the goals have been defined. I think what you are going to write should, will be useful anyway. You will be the last because I think you have uh, thought a lot about that. So, uh, Karin, please. Well, um, it's... it's <laughs> No, I'm a Swedish consensus seeker here. <laughs> I think, I think uh, of course, it's important to that we try to define together with others, because I also think what you said before, Joachim, with sort of thinking of to whom we are speaking and from where we are coming and not taking for granted that everyone knows our jargon. And, and, and so, so it's really important that we are trying to... That's why, why we have been at the UNR Triple C, even though it's very difficult, because we need to go where, where the others are, not to try to get them to our place. Uh, but I think it's important to, to sort of, and, and I guess that was what we did with the national consultation, with the thematic consultations, to try to bring in important issues. But of course, I think what, what my reading of, I mean, I think Rick <laughs> is supposed to say what he meant, but, but I, I would think that if we want to make the report relevant to the political process that is taking place, of course you want to sort of direct it to that dis discussion. And if you don't know exactly where that discussion... We, we didn't know, if, for instance, if there would be goals or not. So how do we then write a report to sort of get it right? Because we want to see where are the best entrance points for what we want to say. And if you don't know where they are, it's more difficult to sort of define the map. Okay, Richard, and please think that maybe they are going to decide not to have water. Would the report will be irrelevant? Um, yeah, but of course not. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it, it, the re what the report will show is that they made a big mistake. <laughs> um, I think, you see, the objective of the report, in the, in the context of the SDGs, it ha kind of has multiple goals. And it's interacting. On one hand, 
We, want to rep we would have wanted the report, if the report came out a year before, then it would have been to inform the process, you know, to give, give solid arguments as to why this can be a target, why this can be a target, why that. If it would come out after the fact, then it could argue the pros, this is great, and this is what's missing that countries might want to consider outside the context of the SDGs. Since they were done in parallel, we were kind of screwed. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we say, and because if we completely missed the boat, if we, if we decide, okay, here's what we think is the most important, and that's not reflected in the SDGs, then the, 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 either the SDGs or the report loses credibility. And it would probably be the report, but I would argue it would be the SDGs. <laughs> and so, so we've had to create something that would both inform uh, and support the process of the SDGs just as it's coming out in the last, but also something that would still have some background material and some use to once the, SDG, once the SDGs are out, to be able to link back, I mean, even if it's not oriented or structured in that way, that those arguments, and you know, let's face it, the, it's, it's, it, we're not really in reinventing the wheel, we're just trying a, a new size and shape of the wheel this time, right? Okay, well, th thank you very much to the three of you, and I'm sure that the three have uh, big challenges with the COP21, with the report, and with uh, conducting the process at the UN Water, and I think we have appreciated uh, that you are doing a great job and really managing the things great, whatever the SDGs are in the future. And thank you very much uh, to you all. Let's uh, applaud our speakers, please. Thank you very much to the chair and panelists of this session. After setting the scene on the water-related SDG goals and targets, we will now move forward to the next session which will look at the state of the art on implementation challenges and tools. So I wish to please ask the chair and speakers of the session to come forward to the, to the plenary. And I wish to take the opportunity to inform you that you will find each morning in your uh, emails, in your inboxes, the conferences daily, which is a brief newsletter that highlights the key aspects for each of the days of the conference. So you may wish to, to check it out if you haven't done so already.